Okay. okay, can I get everybody's attention for a second? Okay, we're gonna get started. Um, I wanna thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, we're the Chicago Labor Speakers Club. And so we have a, hopefully we have a good program for you today. We have uh, some excellent panelists and uh, the topic, um, which is a long one I, I noticed on our flyer, is uh, what role should labor unions play in fighting for police accountability? And uh, even though it's long, it's a very good uh, and important topic in the labor movement today. Um, the first speaker is, gonna, is a member of the Labor Speakers Club's uh, steering committee. And um, so she's gonna give a little bit of an introduction of who we are uh, before we get to our main speakers today. Um, so Kathleen Jensen is, uh, uh, as I said, she's on our steering committee. She was also uh, one of the key people involved in organizing the professionals unit at the University of Illinois Chicago Medical Center. Um, she's on the executive board of her union, which is SEIU Local 73. So uh, give a good round of applause for Kathleen Jensen. <laughs> Um, yeah, welcome, I want to say welcome also, and um, thank you to UE Hall again for hosting this event and giving the space up to us for, for to be able to bring these, these talks here. Um, a couple things that I want to say, if people need to get to the bathroom, it's down in the basement. Um, and we got water in the back, so if you want to like, grab a water, go ahead. Um, so. A little bit about the Chicago Labor Speakers Club. We are all from different unions, I guess. And um, Richard and Jay actually were the ones who kind of got the ball rolling on this, got us together. We um, wanted to have a place where we'd have a forum to be able to talk about some of these different topics that are important to us, um, you know, things that involve the labor movement in general. Um, so I was really excited when we, when the opportunity came up to do this because it, for me it was a way to get out of my local and actually get involved in this movement and we, our hope is that we're building a solidarity that really wasn't existing before. Um, you know, I think that we kind of feel sometimes that we're working within our union, our, our, our unions themselves and really working for you know, we get all fired up during contract time and then that's it. And we really aren't building towards anything else. And hopefully that's what this is for. Um, our first event was last March. We had Joe Burns who um, wrote a book about um, public sector employees striking and bringing back the strike as our most important tool that we have as, as workers. So um, we had a great event with him. In June, we had Mike Newman from Ask Me Council 31 um, in a panel discussion. We had Bunny Johnson here, who's just a great Ask Me member and motivator. Um, in July, we had Jesse Sharkey from Chicago Teachers Union and Rob, Rob Heiss from IFT here. Um, and of course, um, you know, that is becoming something that we're all watching, that, that the, the teacher's c contract fight. So hopefully um, we hear some good news about that soon. And in September we had Stephen Franklin, who used to be a labor writer for the Chicago Tribune, speak. And then here we are today. We have a great event. Um, if people have ideas of things that they want, speakers they want to see here, or topics that are of interest, just you can reach out to us. We have a Facebook page, Chicago Labor Speakers Club. So like us on Facebook and you can contact us that way or you can contact us through our emails which um, just come on, come on up to one of us and we will give you the information on how to get together with us. So thank you. Okay, also uh, before we get started, I wanna uh, welcome uh, Labor Beat, the TV show, uh, who's uh, filming uh, today, and uh, hopefully uh, people in our audience know what Labor Beat is. It's uh, um, it's the people's uh, television in uh, Chicago and uh, throughout the, the state of Illinois, I learned as well. Um, but Labor Beat has a half-hour TV show on uh, uh, um, the Access Channel 19, if you have cable TV in Chicago, and they, you can see it every Thursday at 4 o'clock or Friday at 9.30. And so... Uh, um, the other way around. Thursday, <laughs> Thursday 9.30. 
I I'm did sorry, it. Fr I'm sorry, Friday, 9.30. Yeah. Got Friday. One of us is dyslexic. We're not sure which one. But, uh, <laughs> um, but Thursday at 4 o'clock and, and Friday at 9.30. Is that correct? Thursday, 9.30. <laughs> Thursday at 9:30. Right. Look at check, check your local listings. <laughs> uh, also, uh, if you're in Champaign or Rockford, uh, Labor Beat exists there too. But uh, uh, but it's on Thursday and Friday, and we're not sure of the times. But uh, but it is an excellent. Seriously, it's been around for decades, and it's been filming uh, with the corporate media. It doesn't film, which is uh, is uh, what we our struggles. And so uh, even though uh, we, we're having trouble with uh, the times and we're telling a joke, it, it is a serious uh, uh, TV show that's for us. So uh, thank, you, thank you to Labor Beat for Give them a round of applause. Later. <laughs> uh, before I introduce our first speaker, who's uh, going to be Frank Chapman from the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, I wanted to introduce uh, 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 Mike Elliott, uh, who's uh, the Labor Committee chairperson for that organization. And uh, it's just been a, a tireless fighter for the, around the issue of uh, uh, police accountability, uh, especially within the labor movement. So, uh, Mike, could you stand up and uh, be acknowledged? So, give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, okay. So, our first speaker is uh, is Frank Chapman, who is uh, the field organizer and education director for the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Uh, in August, the alliance organized a 3,000-person march and rally demanding an elected Civilian Police Accountability Council, or CPAC. Um, if you haven't heard the word CPAC before, Frank's going to explain to you this is a very important uh, uh, concept and an important fight uh, here in Chicago. Um, this was the lar this 3,000-member uh, march though, was the largest protest against police crimes in Chicago in the years since Ferguson. Uh, it was also the largest uh, since the 1970s protests in the wake of the murder of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. Uh, the Alliance was founded by uh, Angela Davis and Frank Chapman was the executive director of this national organization in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Frank also spent 20 years in the trade union movement uh, working for SEIU 1199 and a little music for what we're doing. <laughs> um, so Frank was with uh, 1199 and, and the Musicians Union in, in New York City. Um, I've recently gotten to know Frank, and, uh, and I can tell you um, there's very little about the struggle that he doesn't know. And uh, this comes because he's, he studies it, and he analyzes it uh, on a constant level, but also uh, because he's involved in it. He's been involved in it his whole life, and so he speaks you know, from the movement. So uh, give a good round of applause for Frank Kapp. <laughs> Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. Good afternoon. What an honor and pleasure it is for me to be here today to express to you our common concerns in what I believe to be a life and death struggle for democracy and an end to racist repression and economic and social injustices. I'd like to start off my comments with a quote from the AFL-CIO Labor Commission on Racial and Economic Justice. Uh, this was first, uh, statement was first issued in uh, February, or on February 25th, 2015, and I quote, the demand for racial justice cannot be divorced from the fight for economic justice, and the fight for economic justice cannot be pursued without considering educational equity. It is, an, it is no secret that communities of color continue to face higher unemployment rates lower wages, job discrimination, and more economic insecurity, one consequence of which is more encounters with the criminal justice system. Negative encounters with our criminal justice system have long-lasting impacts on families and their surrounding communities, and they harm our efforts to create shared prosperity for all. Movements like Black Lives Matter, Not One More, Fight for 15, and Not Your Model Minority, have shown tremendous courage in taking these issues, which many in this country want to ignore. We in the labor movement should stand with them as partners, allies, and fellow community members. Their fight is our fight. <clears throat> OK, we can uh, stand here today and say with all sincerity that the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Labor Repression has reached out to the labor movement and asked them to join us 
in the campaign to establish by city ordinance an all elected civilian police accountability council. And I can report that the response has been better than anything in our over 40 years of organizing around the issues of police crimes and counter the criminal justice system. Of course, some of that we owe to our labor committee, uh, which is led by uh, Mike Elliott. When we put 3,000 people in the streets this past August 29, we were joined by United Electrical Workers, SEIU, Local 73, and HCII, the Black Caucus of the Teachers Union, Fight for 15, and ASHME. It was very encouraging, and I believe a very positive development. As good as these developments are, and as much as we embrace our labor allies in this struggle, we are still only just beginning to address the deep and abiding issues of racism we face as a community and a nation. One of those issues that is claiming the lives of our people on a daily basis is police crimes. Let me just say something real quick about police crimes. It's like it sounds. It's when the police commit a crime, like murder, like torturing someone, you know, and even uh, 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 stop and frisk. Now, we know that they're not punished for these crimes. Mostly black people, but not just black people, are being murdered by the police throughout this country. Ferguson is everywhere. And here in the greater Chicago area, we have the equivalent of about five Fergusons, just on the south side alone. We have open and blatant cases of murder, as in the cases of Rakeel Boyd, Flint Former, Ronnie Man Johnson, with the list growing every week, and no one is being prosecuted. In fact, in the Rakeel Boyd case, even the judge, after saying that the officer should have been charged with first degree murder, then proceeded to throw the case out. I've never seen anything like that before in my life, you know. So, we have literally hundreds of cases of people who were tortured and are still languishing in jail decades later while their torturers are still active on the police force and are enjoying retirement with a pension. As you recall, John Burge, when he came out of prison after doing his five years, he was $700,000 richer because he got his pension while he was in prison. How can we claim to be a democracy and live with such travesties of justice. But that is not all. We live in a city where the mayor has apologized for people being tortured and falsely accused, where a city council has passed a resolution, I mean, I'm sorry, a reparations ordinance for some victims tortured by John Byrd, and yet torture victims remain in jail and continue to be presently tortured. Because if you're in jail, you're being tortured presently. If, you, if you're innocent, and you were put there by means of a tortured confession. Now, how ludicrous is that? This is a reflection of a broken criminal justice system and an utterly corrupt political body that is totally incapable of correcting itself. So where does that leave us? We are left under the agonizing heel of repression to wither and die unless we stand up, organize, and fight back. We need the labor movement here in the greater Chicago area to join us so that we, the people, can take power away from those who are killing us and oppressing us. Okay, I heard someone mention something about strike. That's power. So when you want to increase your wages, you want better working conditions, you use your power, you know. So we've got to use our power in terms of organizing people in the communities to change this political system, to change the laws. We gotta do that. And we need labor's help in doing it. We need you to help us get CPAC passed into law because as an ordinance, it will empower us to have community control over the police. To sum up, CPAC will take power from the mayor to appoint the superintendent of police, to put the, this power in the hands of the people and will replace the police board the Independent Police Review Authority, and the Internal Affairs Department. All members of CPAC, that's a Civilian Police Accountability Council, will be elected civilians chosen by the people who live in the various police districts. This is not about good cop versus bad cop. 
psychological training, better professional training, or community relations strategies. CPAC is the democratic solution to police crimes and the political tyranny it creates. CPAC is about community control of the police. We need your help with the support petitions. Presently, we have 25,000 signatures. Our goal is 100,000 as soon as possible. We need your help in every aspect of this campaign as we go about organizing our communities, door by door, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, precinct by precinct, and ward by ward. And you guys know how to do that, all right? We're organizing CPAC neighborhood committees. Like any real political campaign, we need feet on the ground for our field operations, so these are practical ways in which labor can help. We also will need your help this December 10th, International Human Rights Day, when we will renew our complaint to the U.S. Department of Justice demanding federal investigations and prosecutions of cases here in Chicago and the closing down of Holman Square, a torture site that has victimized thousands of people. Finally, let me say this, getting to that final. Just about eight years ago, we experienced perhaps the most, or the greatest transfer of wealth from working people to the corporations and banks in the entire history of our country. Not since the Civil War have we had anything like that. Huge amount of wealth taken from working people and oppressed people of color and given to the banks and cooperations. This is called the financial crisis, right? This financial crisis has precipitated a political crisis that is unprecedented also. More people have been left economically devastated than ever before, yet our government pursues the policy of building our Wall Street and the banks while cutting the budgets that offer any kind of services and help to workers, oppressed people of color, women, in the LGBTQ community. Given how the institutional arrangement of our, of our country is deeply rooted in racism from slavery to the present, black people are the ones hardest hit. And Richard Trumka, president of the FFSL, recognizes this fact and calls upon labor to partner with black people in their struggles against racist injustices. We endorse this call, and we boldly ask you to make up the labor movement I mean, I'm sorry, we boldly ask you to make this bold statement by the labor movement a reality and translate it into action by coming out and helping us and joining the campaign for CPAC. We end with a quote from uh, Richard Trump. Now some people might ask why our labor movement should be involved in all that has happened since the tragic death of Michael Brown in Ferguson. And I want to answer that question directly. How can we not be involved? Thanks, Frank. Uh, you got us off to a good start. I appreciate that. So our next speaker is uh, Tammy Vinson. Uh, Tammy's a, a mother and a grandmother, and uh, she brought some of her family here as backup, I see. Um, and, but. Uh, She's also uh, a special ed teacher. Um, she has a deep concern and compassion for her family and for her students, uh, not just when they're in the classroom, uh, but when they leave to go back to their families and their communities. Uh, Tammy is also a trade unionist. Uh, she's a rank and file member of the Chicago Teachers Union. She's <laughs> you can clap for the Chicago Teachers Union. Uh, yeah, just to say, she's... Uh, Rahm Emanuel's that bought a lot more aspirin because of Tammy, I believe. Uh, um, Tammy ran for alderman uh, in the 28th Ward and uh, gave, uh, gave Rahm all kinds of headaches trying to figure out how to deal with that, with, with, with that candidacy. Um, but so she's a member of the Chicago Teachers Union. She's active in the Chicago Teachers Union's Black Caucus, uh, which uh, organized and marched um, with, uh, with Frank and others on August 29th uh, in the march that was just talked about for police accountability. Um, and so she's also the chair of the caucus of rank and file educators, uh, which is the slate uh, people may know was headed by Karen Lewis that so dramatically changed the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, so give a good round of applause for Tammy. Thank you.
he's already said that I'm uh, with CTU and I'm a teacher. I teach at Oscar de Priest, which is in the Austin area. So um, also part of my little intro, my uh, Black Caucus involvement, the uh, core involvement. So um, I've been involved in a variety of efforts to advocate for the educational needs of the students I serve. I've supported the Fight for 15, the uh, need for an elected representative school board, and then to excessive testing, along with the need for an independent police accountability board. I understand that the work that we do in our classroom is directly impacted by what happens in our communities. So several of the, uh, the students that I serve, because I, I live in the same community where I teach, they've had uh, negative interactions with the police, both in school and outside of school. So our communities are patrolled by officers who are not from the, these areas, not you know west siders. So they view the babies that, that I teach as criminals in training. So I know uh, young men and women have been detained or arrested simply for like walking and talking in the areas where they live. So we know that these areas are high crime areas, but they are also very high poverty areas. And these uh, areas are, are segregated, they are underserved, under-resourced, but these are the areas that we call home. So um, people are unfairly targeted, being labeled as gangbangers, even when you know they're just caught on the street talking to their family members. Students are, arrest or are harassed within the community where they're forced, now forced because of all the school closings, to travel outside of their communities just to get to school, just to get an education. So <clears throat> this dynamic is, um, this set up a dynamic where due to safety concern or the inability to travel, students are dropping out of school as early as sixth grade. So the, all this um, creates is a vicious cycle where you know, they're gonna wind up in jail. So we know they're gonna wind up in jail, they're gonna wind up with negative in interactions with the police with no real, no real hope. So due to the over-criminalization of our youth, many educators feel that there should be a greater police presence in our schools. They believe that unruly or inappropriate behavior should result in punitive measures such as detention or suspension. But I disagree. The resources that are needed to address the social emotional needs of students are not there. The infrastructure needed to offer families job training, access to quality health care, and extracurricular activities to promote um, positive behavior is not being funded. Our, so our students are getting it coming and going. They are being berated by the uh, educational professionals that are not having the skills to be competitive or productive or whatever the expectations are at the time and they're not being given the quality of education needed to achieve whatever outcome we've set up for them. So basically the current ed reform policies are setting our kids up for failure. These failures are being measured by a growing prison population. Although now touted, touted as an urban myth, prison populations or the number of prisons that are being built are based on third grade reading scores. So in just minor things that people are doing are causing them to lose their right to vote, the ability to gain, to, uh, gain become gainfully employed, and the uh, ability to gain access to higher education. So having an unchecked criminal justice system does not benefit us as a society. Sitting comfortably in you know, what was a middle class existence is no longer an option because we're under attack on several fronts. If we are not prepared to advocate for justice and equity for all, we will all soon fall victim to the failed rhetoric that is privatizing the public sector, closing schools and businesses and placing excess on homes in our communities placed on foreclosures. So all of this has led to a further destabilization of our communities. People who live in economically blighted communities are targeted by this excessive policing. And every effort to make a living or to feed a family is criminalized and our children can't even walk outside their front doors. <clears throat> Again, I ran for Alderman on the 28th Ward. And so while I was out uh, gathering signatures and meeting people in the communities, they had, you know, we, they talk about their interactions with the police. We have the elderly who are afraid to go out of their houses and they're being told by the police that if you come and point out the, the criminal, then we'll, we'll deal with it. Or the children that live in the community, young men and women, they're, you know, again, they can't do anything. They can't stand on the corner. They have no access to uh, any services, nothing that will help them become more productive citizens in their community. My son, my 26-year-old son, 
he was leaving out of the house one day because we live on, happened to live on a street that was considered one of the uh, safe passage routes. So I, I'm leaving to go to work. He's handcuffed by the police, and they're saying that that's because he didn't look like he was going to school. Like, why are you here in this area? But that was outside of his home. So <clears throat> we have to, uh, I guess in essence, as labor, we have to consider that we may believe that these are things that are happening to other people, but they're actually happening to us. They're happening in our communities. As workers in the city, we must rec recognize that sitting on the sidelines is not an option. Not only should we be concerned about the unwarranted and unchecked violence many have experienced at the hand of the police, we have to consider the economics of, war of law enforcement. Chicago's budget is built on fines and fees. Many of us are struggling to maintain residence in the city. The police have quotas to meet, and, they are, and we are paying the price, literally. So if you're not prepared to champion the cause for safe communities for all residents, needs can be equally met, we can seek to rein in a system that is bankrupt in the working class. Again, another family story. Um, my, uh, my son, I only have one son, so I always tell stories about him. His uh, girlfriend's car was towed. So to get her car back, we had to pay almost $3,000 just to get her car back. So we're on Superior, that traffic court area. There are like hundreds and hundreds of people there, and this is just in November. So we know that economically, if, a, if an area is over-policed, then you're going to be overly fined or charged or whatever. So how are, again, we're going to be able to survive? So... <clears throat> Again, well, and I know a lot of us understand the red light camera, so again, these are all things that we know that, that the police are our are, are union or whatever, and they may or may not be considered workers, but they are the revenue arm of our government. So if without these fines and fees and tickets, again, something we absolutely have to be concerned with. So <clears throat> we are, um, again, being subject to excessive stops, red light cameras, speed cameras, ticket that caused us to lose our privilege to drive in the city, which for many results in jail time, which leads to loss of income, boots, towing, and other penalties that are causing people to lose their property. So we have to consider, if the revenue generating community safety arm of our government is not meeting the needs of the majority of our citizens, what recourse do we have? Do we sit back while our, neighbor, while our neighborhoods deteriorate and others thrive? Do we watch other crucial services are outsourced and more of our neighbors lose their jobs? Do we continue to sit on the sidelines where our schools are closed and our students are criminalized? No, we seek accountability. We cannot accept and should accept being held hostage in our communities as a result of the disparity in law enforcement. Thank you, Tammy. Um, our next speaker is uh, Stephen Mitten, who's the president of AFSCME uh, Local 2081, which represents workers at the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. Uh, Stephen has been a member of AFSCME for 20 years. Um, before working at DCFS, uh, he was a probation officer in Kankakee County, where he was involved in organizing the officers into AFSCME. Uh, he also served in the Marine Corps uh, for 22 years, where he was able to travel the world and be in contact with people from a lot of different lives and backgrounds and uh, races and cultures and see those things. Uh, recently, our, I'm a member of AFSCME as well. Uh, recently, AFSCME had uh, their annual, or biannual, I should say, uh, statewide Council 31 convention. And uh, at the convention, uh, there was a resolution that was introduced uh, called Black Lives Matter. It was introduced by Ethel Monroe from local 1989. <laughs> Want to stand up, Bethel? Give, give her a round of applause. Uh, uh, um, and j just to say, uh, uh, AFSCME is a very diverse union, um, in both you know in, in every way, I guess you would say. But uh, um, but also uh, in you know who it represents. There's a lot of uh, correction officers in AFSCME, both county and state correction officers. There's a uh, law enforcement people in AFSCME, so introducing a Black Lives Matter is not just uh, something that you know sails through. It was it was clearly uh, the hot topic of discussion uh, uh, for the days that that uh, convention was in session, 
and uh, which is why uh, uh, Stefan is actually, besides all the other things I said, which would get him to be on our panel by itself, um, but he was also the chairman of the resolutions committee at that convention. And it was, uh, you know, he played, a, I think, a very skilled role and a very active role in making sure that this very diverse body uh, passed this resolution. And so, uh, and, and he spoke, uh, gave one of the you know, best speeches of the whole week uh, from the floor on why to support, uh, as though there were several good speeches on this issue. Um, so anyways, I'll give a, a warm welcome to Stefan Mittens. So. <laughs> You know, sometimes inspiration hits you at different points, and uh, actually it hit me last night, so that's why my notes are kind of written on a uh, napkin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But let me kind of work backwards, if I may, going to the, the resolution in our Ask Me um, convention. You know, there's an old saying that sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. That was one of those occasions for me. As being the chair of the resolutions committee, uh, we, I found myself in a position that because we are so diverse, because we have different, uh, different bodies within ASME, there were a lot of different opinions and a lot of different truths being spoken at our table and at our caucus. And because of that, one thing became apparently clear. Your truth should never be compromised, but compromise can come from truth. That was basically what we kind of used as the theme, if you will, to come to the agreement on the resolution. So the resolution that the sister actually proposed was not the resolution that was put on the floor. And the reason because there were some things that were true, however, were very felt to be offensive to certain parts of our, our body to law enforcement, uh, to the people in law enforcement and, and in corrections. And so we had to, again, come to a compromise in regards to what our truths are and what we hold them to be, but still be comprehensive in regards to how we approach this whole matter, this whole issue of Black Lives Matter. Again, in regards to asking uh, for forgiveness, by being the resolution's chair, I'm not supposed to show partiality to one resolution or the other. And actually the day that the resolution, the, the resolution was scheduled for a particular day and it kept getting pushed back and getting pushed back. So the day that it finally was going to be heard, I leaned over to the chair and said, I'm going to speak on this matter. Not that I want to speak on this matter or may I speak on this matter, but I'm going to speak on this matter. So they had actually had to replace me as the chair so that I could come down into the audience and then speak in regards to this, uh, to this important issue. And I'd like to just share with you a few things that I shared with the, uh, with the convention. Particularly our union, ASME, the uh, American Federation of State, uh, County and Municipal Employees, has a long history in regards to being involved in social issues, and this is a social issue. We were for every ma married, if you will, with social issues. If you go all the way back to 1969, the uh, sanitation workers strike in Memphis, Tennessee. If you recall that strike, now yes, it was a labor strike, but it was more than a labor strike, it was a strike about, and it was an emphasis on social issues. If you remember the iconic pictures of the men wearing signs saying, I am a man. It didn't say, it didn't say I'm a union worker. It doesn't say I'm a man on strike. It says I am a man because they were pointing to the facts of the indignities that were being bestowed upon them as black men in that field. And if you really know your history, you go back, what even prompted all of that was a couple years prior to that, there was uh, two black men were on a truck picking up garbage, two white men were driving. A torrential rainstorm came, so they pulled into one of the substations. But even in 1969, the black men were not allowed to go into the same building as the two, as the white, that the white men went into. So in order to shelter themselves from the rain, they got into the dumpster part of the truck, back with the garbage, if you will. So they're sitting in the back of the garbage, and out of nowhere, the giant arm comes down and crushes them to death. Now, the official version was that it was mechanical, uh, mechanical issue, mechanical error, but there are some who still believe that that may have been intentional. That is what prompted then the black men in the sanitation working in uh, Memphis at that time to really galvanize and say, you know, we need to address this. 
they were they then became represented by ASME. And if you also recount your history, Martin Luther King came. That's why he was in Memphis, because he was in support of their strike. So King even recognized that there is this marriage between labor and, and the social issues of the day, which we now also have to keep in mind and also have to keep our focus on keeping that marriage sanctified and keeping that marriage whole. You know, unfortunately, with, this, with the upstart of Black Lives Matters, I have to think back on some of my own interactions and, and some things that have happened in my life which up until now I hadn't really thought as being, I'm not gonna say not being right, but, not, but being just part of the day, as an example. I'm in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I did my undergraduate work there at, uh, at Tennessee State. Some classmates and I went over to the other side of town to visit another university, Vanderbilt University. And Vanderbilt is known as the Ivy League of the South. And it's a prestigious, uh, predominantly white university. So my friends and I were walking around the, uh, the campus and we're just kind of taking a view of the disparity, if you will, in between their campus and, and ours. All of a sudden, it's almost like out of nowhere, two or three uh, squad cars, if you will, roll up on us. And one of the gentlemen, uh, the police officers get out and says, uh, what are you doing here? I'm trying to be a little smart, plus we're from the north, you know, from Chicago. Uh, oh, no, we're, we're students here. This officer broke it down to me and says, look, there's 24,000 students on this campus. There's less than 1% black, and 15% of them are athletes. You don't look like an athlete to me. What are you doing here? <laughs> you know, that was my first introduction to the real reality of race matters. My son is sitting out here in the, in the audience, and he may not remember this, but even today, as a 54-year-old man, I still get a little tense when the police roll by me when I drive in my car. There is a routine that I go through, if you will, if I'm ever pulled over by the police. Particularly if it's at night, I turn on my dome lights. I turn off the car, I put my keys on the dashboard. I keep both hands on the steering wheel and I let down the driver's window before the officer even approaches me. This is something that has become routine to me. So once when he was uh, younger and a couple of my other uh, children were in the car with us, we were pulled over in Kankakee. And so I intentionally went an additional block with this squad car following me with the lights going to prepare my children. I said, listen, we're about to be pulled over. It's okay. Don't say anything. You know, don't, don't be afraid. I'll handle everything. But I had to reassure them because I did not want them to become a casualty of what I was about to experience as well. Working in probation in Kankakee, um, I, Kankakee was a small town at that time, it still is. I had an office in the courthouse. I basically knew all the state's attorneys, I knew the majority of the police, I knew all the judges, and in fact, there was a small group of us that played basketball every Wednesday night. I kind of upgraded, and this is before I really put on my, my union hat, so to speak, so I, I kind of upgraded and bought a, a car that I had really wanted for a while. I bought a Saab. They're, they're not a business, but I bought a Saab. The first month that I had that Saab, I was pulled over 13 times by the same people that I play basketball with because they stopped seeing Stephen Mittens and just started seeing a young-looking black man in an expensive-looking car. And unfortunately, and, and to my own demise, it didn't seem that out of the ordinary. It, I, because at that point, I had taken it as, this is just a natural course of, of life. But again, as I matured and as I got in, even deeper into the, the labor movement, and started to understand this marriage, if you will, between the social issue and the labor issue, it really started to dawn upon me how sick I actually was in thinking that. And I had to kind of cleanse myself in regards to my thinking and understanding the impact that it has, that the society has in regards to how the disproportionate treatment 
of different groups. Throughout society and throughout history, there have always been moments of time to where a particular group mattered more than another. World War II, Jewish lives mattered. Apartheid, black South African lives mattered. This is our moment and this is our time to identify and show that here in the United States, not only do all lives matter, but right now, particularly black lives matter. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, our last speaker uh, is Carl Rosen. Uh, Carl is the Western Region President of the United Electric Radio and Machine Workers Union, UE, which uh, this is uh, their hall that we're in right now. Um, I've known Carl uh, the longest of any of our speakers today, uh, I think decades, I think. Uh, and I realized as I was trying to figure out how to introduce him that uh, I don't know that, I probably know less about him than the other speakers because he almost never, or at least in my experience, talks about himself. So what I thought I would do, because I realized what he never tires of speaking about is UE. And uh, uh, I realized that that's because uh, really his life has been so intertwined uh, with UE. And so uh, maybe I'll introduce the UE, and uh, by doing that, I'll introduce uh, Carl Rosen. Uh, but the UE is, uh, was one of the big uh, CIO unions uh, that emerged and, and uh, uh, organized uh, common people when at, at a time when most union members were, had to have a special skill uh, or craft uh, to get into a union. And in the 30s and 40s, uh, the UE grew to be one of the largest unions in the country. Um, the UE didn't discriminate against people because of race or gender, um, or politics for that matter. And uh, for that reason, they were attacked viciously in the 1950s um, during the McCarthy scares and uh, by both uh, friends in labor and uh, by uh, people like Joe McCarthy and others uh, outside of labor. Um, and so, uh, as, but, th but that tradition in the UE continues in the fact that uh, it's appropriate that the Chicago Labor Speakers Club uh, have their programs in this hall because it's grounded in uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of history. And, it's, uh, uh, and it's th that's why I think you see Carl Rosen um, when you go to the, the protest against Walmart, if there's a fight uh, for immigrant rights, Carl Rosen is there uh, representing the UE. Um, and he's, he's there when, it's, when we're having a discussion about uh, labor unions and police accountability. It's, uh, he's, he's here with us as well. So give a good round of applause to Carl Rosen. Thank you, Richard, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, UE Hall. Very, uh, very glad to be able to host this and very glad to have uh, all of you here. So I, I do come at this issue from the perspective of, of my union, of UE, because Richard's right, it is a big part of my life. Uh, so, and it is where I've learned uh, basic ideas about unionism and about, um, and about society and about how we ought to carry ourselves if we want to work for a better world. And, uh, you know, UE has, has always been committed to social justice unionism, to unionism that's rooted in the community, and a unionism that's unafraid to militantly confront the powers that be when the situation calls for it. And I, I make those points because I think those points intersect with labor's responsibility to be part of the movement for police accountability. And in addition, I think labor also has a general duty in response to the great moral clarion call that an injustice to one is an injustice to all. If we believe that as a labor movement, if we believe that as a people, then, then we have to do something about what's been happening uh, around issues of, of lack of police accountability. So I'd like to expand on those points a little bit and then uh, spend more time talking about the practical impediments to actually get a large portion of the labor movement on board. I, excellent work has been done by some of the people in this room uh, it was great to see the number of labor folks who were involved in the, uh, in the march in August. Uh, but the reality is it was mostly the usual suspects, right? And, and not even completely the usual suspects, right? So, uh, and, and to affect real change, to get a city council resolution passed, um, we will probably need and we certainly want to have a bigger part 
of the labor movement on board, and there's real challenges on, on making that happen. So I want to talk about those uh, some, and, and I don't pretend to have the answers uh, on all of it, and hopefully we'll have some questions and discussion from the other panelists that'll, that'll help us uh, maybe, maybe see where we can go to, to get to where we need to be. So to the question of, you know, what's the argument for, for unions to take, to take this up? Uh, first of all, for unions to create effective movement for worker justice in the workplace, they also have to be engaged in a whole variety of struggles for justice for working people in society at large. Without that, labor can't sustain a base and relevancy in the working class. And on the flip side, without labor support, the community generally cannot sustain the type of struggle that's needed to keep the wealthy and corporations from running roughshod over all working class organizations, including unions. Since the lack of police accountability has its greatest impact on working class communities, this is an issue that the labor movement cannot afford to avoid. And since the negative impacts cut deepest by far on working class communities of color, thus contributing to racial divisions in society, and since racial, racial divisions have always been used as one of the greatest weapons to weaken labor unions, unions have an additional need, just from that practical point of view, an additional need to tackle this issue head on. And unions also need to take note that in times of real labor unrest, the police are called in to help suppress labor power, violently if necessary. So getting real community control of the sort that's being suggested here to help deal with the issue of what's happening to communities of color could also possibly help the labor movement so that at times where um, those kind of, that kind of uh, labor protest takes place in the future, uh, maybe there, it would make it a little bit harder for corporate forces to use police departments in that way to suppress labor. Labor also has a special role to play in tackling this issue because, I think as has already been mentioned, the Chicago police, like most police forces in urban areas, are unionized and are therefore generally accepted as part of the labor movement. This contributes to hesitancy among much of the labor movement about criticizing the role of police in the community. It doesn't justify that hesitancy, but we have to recognize that it's there. So I think we need to look at the factors underlying this if we're gonna find a way to engage the great bulk of the labor movement in the struggle to reduce police violence and abuses. So starting with, police forces basically re recruit working class kids. And many of them are literally, literally the brothers and sisters of workers who are members of other unions, especially those in the building trades, higher paid factory work, and also um, a lot in the public sector. In addition, most unions these days do not find themselves confronting police power on the street when unions are acting as unions. Most labor pickets and protests today are done in a fashion where the police largely accommodate them rather than limit them. Perhaps after some prior negotiation or whatever, but that's usually the end result, that once you're out on the street, the police seem to be working with you rather than, rather than against you for most labor-led events in the streets. Now, this is more a reflection of the non-militant state of the labor movement than it is of any desire of the police department, especially the higher ups to help unions. But it still leaves many union leaders feeling like, you know, we get along with the cops, all right? So maybe this isn't our issue. And so we have to recognize that that's an everyday experience. And we also have to recognize that in this recent period, with the attacks on public sector workers, there's actually been some actual unity around demands between the police and other public sector unions. You know, when you look at attacks on pensions, for example. And that's led, at times, I've seen it, I've experienced some feeling of solidarity in the streets. I, I think 
those of you, and I bet most of you here, were part of at least one, if not more than one, of the big teacher unions uh, marches through downtown during the strike, uh, noticed the banter and goodwill that was going back and forth between teachers and, and, the, and the police, the police who were blocking traffic for the protests rather than blocking protests to help the traffic, right? And you know, it's because they all had similar issues and, and, they, and they knew it. And, uh, and so the police basically let, seemed to be letting the teachers shut down streets in the loop at, at will. Um, now, that may have been actually because there were higher ups who decided that, you know, there's so many people out there, we're not really gonna stop them anyway. And, uh, and just uh, politically and with the broad community support, it was better to let them go. But again, it had that practical impact of, of leaving people feeling like, you know, these, you know, this is another, that the police were, were being okay because police or union members also were facing the same attacks we are. And so there's a, there's a kinship there. That, I would argue, then turns around to a little bit of difficulty in getting some of those unions sometimes uh, to, to realize, you know, that, that they still need to take a lead in, in challenging uh, what's, what's happening to the community on the street. Because the fact remains that the lack of police accountability is a great danger to working class people in general and the labor movement also. So we need to find ways to, uh, to move unions on this issue. I would say the conversation probably needs to start with a recognition that the issue is less about individual police personnel, although there certainly are bad individual police personnel, but it's less about the individual police personnel and much more about a system that has been structured from the top to allow and even condone abusive behavior and the cover-ups that follow. So if we approach this as something from the top, not the bottom, I think we've got a better, better uh, chance at at moving forward on this and getting labor on board. And then we're also gonna to have to deal with the role of the, of the FOP itself. And I know there are arguments that have been raging for a long time about whether police unions are truly working class institutions in the way that, that other unions are. And I, I don't, I'm certainly not weighing in one side or the other. All I'm gonna say is most of the rest of the labor movement in this town recognizes the FOP as a union. And so we have to, that's a starting point for the discussion. We have to recognize that. And frankly, you know, I think folks see when the FOP strongly defends cops who are accused of wrongdoing, sometimes really bad wrongdoing, sometimes, as has been said, murder, right? Um, we have to recognize that many unions see this as similar behavior as to what they're called upon to do, in fact, legally required to do when a member of theirs is accused of having violated some rule or whatever else by management, it's their legal duty to defend them. But of course, most unions don't go very far in defending union, defending workers when the facts are clearly against them. And most unions don't stand in the public eye on matters of life and death when they're mounting their defenses. So there are some differences here, and we need to talk about that. So these are issues that, that need to be grappled with, uh, possibly with serious discussions between other unions and the FOP, if we could get it to that point at some point, on how to draw a line between where proper defense of a member ends and overzealous behavior of totally unacceptable behavior starts. There's a line there somewhere, and we've got to find a way as a, as a labor movement to, to help the FOP see it. So I don't pretend to have all the answers on how we move this conversation forward in the labor movement regarding police accountability, but I am convinced we can find some starting points rooted in, in the basic principles that I think we're all engaged in every day, the basic principles of class solidarity and justice, and try to go from there. And I'd certainly argue we have the obligation to make that effort to do it. It's too important an issue for us to stand on the sidelines and, and just hope for the best. Thank you.
Thank you, Carl. Um, we're going to take a question and answer uh, in a second here. I have a couple of announcements. Um, also, Larry's going to move the microphone uh, somehow. See, that's a good TV guy. They usually don't help you with your... Uh, and NBC doesn't help us when they come to, to shoot our... In fact, they don't shoot our events often. Um, but uh, so anyways. Um, but uh, uh, before uh, I get to the announcements, uh, first of all, some of you, when you came in, you put money in the jar. Thank you very much. That helps us with our costs. People, we know you all came here to hear from our panelists and not from you. So, uh, so uh, ask, uh, ask your questions. So are there any uh, questions or comments? So Larry, you want to go first? Um, yeah, i got a question. Um, at, at one or two of the um, alliance meetings, the notion has come up that maybe um, this should be a movement in labor to divorce the rest of labor from law enforcement. Because, in, in my mind anyway, I see that it's sort of a divide and conquer strategy that the corporate world has, has, has perpetrated upon labor. By like having soldiers, their soldiers, in the midst of labor. And I'd like to have Brother Stefan answer that if he can. Can, can law enforcement be, be separated from the rest of labor? In my humble opinion, I think that that is very difficult to do from the standpoint that you still have two issues that you look at. You have the, their issues of, or their concerns of them in their job in, in regards to what it is, the function that they provide and that they do in, in society as enforcing the laws. But then you also have the workplace issues. Uh, very briefly, I have four cousins, four male cousins who are LAPD. What becomes problematic is that once you join that force, your thinking becomes one of the most heated discussions I've ever had was with one cousin who's been on the force the longest about the Rodney King uh, riots. His, now as a black man, his point was the only thing wrong with that was that they didn't do it right. Had they hit him right the first time, they would have broken his arm, he wouldn't be able to get up, and then he would, then the situation would have been quashed. Now when you have that type of ingrown thinking incorporated into some of our union brothers and sisters, you know, in the police force, that becomes problematic. But the issue, uh, the other issue becomes, so how do you then divorce that part, or how do you cut out that part from the fact that they are still in need and desirous of being rep properly represented by the employer, uh, being fairly treated on the job, those type of things. So I, I think that that's a very murky area, and quite frankly, I don't have a definitive answer to that, but that's just kind of my view on on that, if, if any of the other panelists. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind weighing in on that. Do, do we need to move this down? Or? Yes. Okay, if I speak loud enough, people can hear me. Okay, so um, I, I think part of the question is a, is a tactical question of, is this what we want to lead with right now? Um, I, I think our first charge is to get the labor movement on board with with putting civilian control sufficient that police forces no longer can be used in the way they've been used as a, as a force of suppression against people whose main problem is that they're in poverty. And if we could resolve the issues of poverty, a lot of the other issues uh, that supposedly the police are dealing with would go away anyway. And I think if we try to at the same time take on the issue of throwing the police out of the labor movement in some form, that we're trying to move the rest of the labor movement forward on supporting a call for civilian control of police and trying to get a more rational system, the whole, the whole criminal justice or criminal injustice system that we have at this point. I think we may find ourselves um, moved away from what we can accomplish at, at this time. Uh, where that ends up at some future time, you know, uh, that, that's, that's another question, but I, I don't think it's a question that, that we have a labor movement that's anywhere close to being willing to consider today. Yeah, I, I uh, well, I like to approach it from the standpoint of uh, military tactics. Uh, we got a big enough enemy trying to get uh, the aldermen, 
and the mayor and all them people checkmated on the issue of civilian control of the police, community control of the police. I don't see the labor movement at this particular point in time uh, taking that position that, that Barry just talked about, okay? So now, we're already engaged in one fight here. Do we want to engage in another fight with the labor movement about the exclusion of the police? I don't think so. That's, that's my own personal opinion, you know. Uh, as an organization, we have not taken a position on it. But I would, I would fight that position within my organization because we need to deal with one battle at a time, you know. And the battle that we're dealing with right now is community control of the police, which doesn't exclude the police from, from supporting that. You know, we've had, we've had people who have been on the police force, like Pat Hill, who supports that, you know. And there may even be some police who support it because it's an issue of democracy. It's an issue of democracy. It's a democratic solution to a problem that has been created in our, in, 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 in our community where the police are being given tyrannical power to run wild, you know. We're saying harness them, put them under control, you know. And we may even be able to win some police over to this position. It's about a fight for democracy. It's a democratic struggle, you know. Uh, and I think we should keep it on that page. Uh, this came up in a meeting that we had with uh, SEIU. And they said, uh, one of the people there in the meeting was, I'm not calling no names and bearing no blames, but one of the people in the meeting said, uh, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm married to a police officer. Said, has he committed a crime? Has he murdered anybody? You know, has he tortured anybody? Because these are the police that we're talking about. And this is what's out of control. It's what the police are doing. It's in blatant violation of the Constitution of the United States and people's human rights. You know, and we need to put a checkmate on that. On that, you know. And in doing that, we got to be real focused. We can't get our focus, you know, off into straightening out the labor movement. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that's not what we're trying to do. That's all I got. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking in, in terms of uh, labor's uh, role. When we consider, you know, in, in most of, of our urban areas, the police force, and I guess other than L.A., it doesn't represent the community that the police are serving. So my thought would be, you know, labor should first address that, you know, just the, the racial imbalance. But then from a federal level, we militarized our police to the point that they're occupying a lot of the communities that they're serving. How do we change that mindset? Mm -hmm. So somehow, I think we'd have to get within that, that, that system to make those changes. We can try, you know, you know, protesting and doing whatever to make those changes from the outside, but I think it would be, uh, we need to work within. So that level of separation, I don't think would be to our benefit now. Let me check. In. Does people hear all right? Is the volume okay? Anybody not here, raise your hand. Okay. I mean, not hearing me, but I mean, with this being right. I can be loud. I know. Um, just uh, one last announcement. Our, our passing of the hat. We collected one hundred and seventy-five dollars. So give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. Other questions? Maria. Um,
this is not new. This is not new here, it's not new in my country, it's not new around the world. The problem is that we are the three weak in different areas, in different movements, in terms of labor. It's unable in this moment to start really change the condition of labor. We know the fighting for 15 today. On the one side, we are fighting for 15. On the other side, they are talking about we need to decrease the, the labor force and we need to decrease the wage. So there are so many battles in this. And at this point, we need to figure out, I'm totally on this front, that we need to figure out how we can select our battle. And this one is something that we really need you know. Comments? Questions? Go ahead, brother. I think we've all heard that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This man brought up a good point, and he, his, his approach to being practical should be looked at. A colleague friend of mine who directed the Department of Psychiatry at the GSU, she left her post a few decades ago when she joined the, the, the head of the Department of Psychiatry for the Los Angeles Police Department. And she was a that their group was, in, was responsible for creating a psychological evaluation for hiring new police officers. And as we were discussing one day, she shared with me that a significant amount of police officers that were hired did not pass the evaluation and were recommended against. And especially after they were involved in shootings, there were other recommendations that were ignored. If there is an ability for whatever institution can get into a position to create its own psychology test and make those recommendations binding, I think we could look more at what to do about the cow before it leaves the barn. I would like to state this. Part of the educational process in regards to either the police or the community is actually, I think, should start in the community. It starts with us. The reason I say that is this. It reminds me of uh, the one scene in the, the movie A Few Good Men where uh, Tom Cruise is cross-examining Jack Nicholson on the stand, and Jack finally breaks down and tells him, you, you don't want to hear the truth. You don't, you know. You want me on that wall. You want me to protect you from those people out there. And part of the problem with the community is that we distinct, we separate ourselves. There, there are them and there are us. And sometimes we want the police to take care of them by whatever means it takes for them to do that. But we want to be safe from them. So once we start to understand the humanization of all of us, the us's and the them's, that we are all, that we all have basic human rights, then we, we will not be accepting of the treatment of the thems by the police when it's in benefit of us and not be so indignant when then that treatment comes to fall upon us. So once we understand tr that treatment should be equal for all in all aspects, then we can start to work on that other, uh, the other entity of the police in regards to how they deal with that because unfortunately we have been part and parcel in creating this monster. We've kind of let them run amok because we want them to run amok to keep them away from us. But yeah. Um, let me go back to what I said earlier. It's the issue of democracy. Now, how, how, do, how are some democracies supposed to work? It's supposed to be based on people power. What is the problem with the police state? The problem with the police state is that the people don't have no power. The police got the power. They got the power of life and death over you. Now, in the African-American community, and, and listen very closely, within the African-American community, we are living virtually under a police state. We can be stopped and frisked anytime they feel like stop. We, we got a case, the Howard Morgan case, I don't know if you've heard of it or not, where a police officer was stopped by other police officers and he still got shot 28 times because he was African-American. And they saw a gun and they all panicked, you know. Now, this is a very concrete and a very real problem that we have to address. And it has to do with power relationships. 
the power relationship between us and the police, where they got all the power and we got none. We have to change that. And that's what this law is about. That's what CPAC is about. It's about changing the power. We can get to the psychological training and all that stuff later on, you know. Right now, we need to change the power relationships and take out of their hands the fact that they have the power of life and death over us and also the ability to have us in prison for long periods of time. Do you realize we got 100 people that are in jail right now who were tortured and put there? And, we, and we're not, you know, we're not getting them out, you know. So that's, for us, is number one. Now, once CPAC or, or, or the people are given power, then we can deal with retraining. We, then the community will be dealing with that, not some professionals, you know, but the community will be dealing with that, you know. The community will have a voice in how their communities are policed which is not what's going on now. What's going on now is we have no voice. We're not even at the table. You know, you can't count them people in city council as representing us on this issue because they don't, you know. So we're talking about bringing the people to the table, giving the people a voice, that that be the first order of business in addressing this issue of police crimes. Can I do a follow-up? Let me ask anybody else. Yeah. And, no, that's fine. Oh. Real briefly. Mm -hmm. Briefly. Um, we are talking about a power dynamic. If you can create some, uh, some type of uh, institution that can give binding <coughs> recommendations as to the psychological fitness of the officer before he is handed a badge, before he's even hired, if there is a board that says, okay, we can move this individual forward, he's now a part of the pool that can be hired. This stops it way before the cow gets out of the barn, and now we got to react to what's going on. Tammy? Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I don't disagree that, um, that that level of oversight is needed at the beginning. And I think Chicago, I'm not positive, but I think Chicago may have some level of, of a psychological assessment. But if the, if the system that is responsible for the hiring overlooks a person's um, Disqual they're disqualified. They're hiring people that are prone to certain types of behavior because that's, that's what they want. That's what they want in place. They want people that can easily dehumanize the people that they're, they're there to patrol. So they're not hiring people with the mis mission of serving and protecting, you know, not, not our stuff, but other people's stuff. So why I believe that with the level of community engagement and, and uh, that level of accountability, you're not going to just keep allowing these things to happen within our community and go unchecked. So, you know, if, they're, if the system that's allowing these people to be hired is not um, monitoring their behavior, they're not uh, holding them accountable, then the community needs to do that. And I, I, think, I, I don't think there's disagreement here. I don't think Frank was disagreeing either. No. I think what he's saying is we aren't going to get to the point where we can get that kind of system put in place until such time as we've got community control. So it is one of the things we can certainly point out is that we want to make sure, uh, we want community control so that we make sure the folks who are getting hired represent the community, right? And also are going to be respectful of the community, are not going to be folks who are prone to violence, but instead are prone to finding solutions. But I will say, if we only did that part and didn't change how the police force is structured and led and for what reasons, it's not going to make that much of a difference because I think there's plenty of people who go onto the police force with pretty good intentions and become jail guards and therefore union members also with pretty good invention, <laughs> intentions. And I've seen in my own union become social workers who are making you know, determinations in like child welfare cases, et cetera. And then you're thrown into a system where it becomes a them against us, where the them is this kind of semi-military, not in the case of the social workers, but certainly in the case of police and, and, and uh, prison guards, a semi-militarized institution, and the enemy, right, are the people that you're patrolling. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like the old saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything you see is a nail, right? And, and so we, we create that, and that's why I said our focus 
at least initially it seems to me, needs to be at the top, right? And what is, is, why is the police force being run in this way? Why are we using it in this way? And if you're doing that, if we can challenge that uh, and make those changes through civilian control, then we have a chance at starting to crack the rest of the nut. Well, um, excuse me, the uh, CTU Black Caucus uh, submitted a resolution to support CPAC, and we did within our own caucus. There wasn't, uh, you know, any pushback within our, our caucus. The pushback when we took it to the uh, to the larger body, to the House of Delegate, it wasn't uh, that anyone personally that, you know, I interacted with disagreed with it as, as something that we needed to do, that level of accountability, but it was still... Uh, you know, some cautious hesitation that there are teachers that are married to policemen. The same thing, you know, do we, um, you know, penalize everyone within that, in, within that grouping for the be bad behavior of, of a few. So, but we were able to get it passed after, um, you know, I think that the CPAC um, flyer, we, um, we modified it so that it was more user friendly, but after that we were able to get it through. <clears throat> In, in the resolution that we did were successful in passing with ASME, um, we, what we basically had to do was to, I'm not going to say water down, but at least change the dynamic to a degree, to focus more on education of, the, of, the, of law enforcement rather than condemnation of law enforcement. And so, and, but we also recognize that we may be talking about a small population from the standpoint that, you know, it's that 5% bad apple uh, scenario to where not all police officers are acting outside of the law. However, the 5% that are taints and colors the other 95%. And so the education aspect comes in when you talk about the, the, the blue wall of silence. You know, you, you, you run into all of those type of things, so even the, the so-called good cops don't want to shake the tree of, the, of what may be going on with the bad cops. So our resolution spoke more toward education, not condemnation, and, and try to be more universal in, in our approach. Uh, just one last footnote. Uh, we talk, I mentioned I have four cousins LAPD. I had a fifth one that tried out. He didn't pass a psychological. Now he's a, now he's a uh, financial banker. <laughs> <laughs> Brother in the back of the booth. Oh, 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 Greg, oh, Greg, Greg, behind you. You're next. Frank, Frank wanted to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, wanted to, I wanted to respond to the question. Uh, I can't respond to it as a trade unionist because that's not what I am at the moment. But I, I can respond to it as a community organizer. 
and that is that uh, our approach to this question is when we go to the trade union movement and ask for help, we are very concrete about what we're asking for. We are not confused, you know. We're asking for help on the ground, you know. We are doing a campaign, a political campaign, you know, that is talking about making a very radical and systemic change in the way things are done here in the city of Chicago with regard to the police, you know. Uh, so we know when we present these propositions to the union that there may be modifications, there may be changes, you know. Uh, okay, cool, no, no, no problem, you know. As long as you're coming out in support of CPAC, make all the changes you lack, you know. Because, you know, this is not going to be picture perfect, you know. And, and we realize that your organization has to take into consideration what it's organizing for. It's like we have to take into consideration what we're organizing for. And so we try to work out uh, those differences so that we keep our eye on the prize, you know. And the prize is community control of the police, you know. That's what the prize is. So uh, you, you two can decide which one goes first, you the next one. I'd like to hear the panel speak on the issue of what has been the historical relationship of labor to the police. If we had trying to answer that question of the FOP, because uh, I know labor has a long history with having their heads cracked by the police. Um, yeah. And black people are, are proportionally the most unionized people in this country, okay? More than any other group. Okay, so black people are just labor in black face. So I'd like to hear the, the uh, panel speak on that in terms of this separation between black and labor. Uh, and if black people are labor, then we're talking, and, and we're talking about policing and what labor unions are going to do, that we have a crisis of the economy that's not only affecting black people, and what are they saying about policemen, policing? They're saying that police ain't the answer. Doing nothing with the police need to be getting rid of. It. It's, it's social activities in the community. That came out of the chief of police uh, meeting last week. So speak to those issues. Oh, my. No, you go. Oh. No, uh, I was just thinking when we, when we um, I think mostly everyone touched on the fact of, of poverty. We think about, uh, you know, the, the economics of, of, of policing, I guess, because with, with poverty, with lack of job training, with lack of educational opportunities, we create crime. I mean, you know, a lot of it, is tied to that. So if we, um, I guess, if the powers that be spend more time and money and effort on policing, then there are a whole lot of other social ills that they don't have to, to focus on it. And the, you know, the austerity policies that we're living under now, with the lack of social service, with the lack of of, of regard for for, you know, people that live in our communities, then, you know, just lock them up. And then, I, you know, I didn't realize until recently that the prison population is, is it's a, it's a workforce. They're doing, they're doing work in jail that they're making money for companies that are outsourcing to the prison. So why wouldn't we create that population? So then what, what do we do to guard against that, I guess? So yeah, and black people are losing their jobs left and right, so I don't know how, uh, I don't know the data, but I'm thinking our uh, union affiliations are not as high as they were historically. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'd add to that, you know, I, number one, obviously we have an economic system right now that is structured to create poverty, right? It's how corporations are making money is by having poverty. And that's obviously something uh, we're going to have to, uh, uh, have to tackle um, to really bring about um, a better situation for working people. Um, but I don't think any of us want to wait until we're able to fully resolve that to end police brutality. I think we need to, in the meantime, take concrete steps against police brutality. Now the question of the historic relationship between police and, uh, and labor, uh, certainly police have been used a lot to stop the labor movement in the past when the labor movement was militant in this country. There's a lot less militancy now. But I, I remember, you know, my dad was also a, uh, a union activist and, and, and then a, a union leader, and talking about the big strike we had against Alan Bradley in, in Milwaukee, which was a big factory, one of the biggest in Milwaukee, several thousand people, and it was like 1970, 1971, something like that. 
And it was a huge strike. Uh, but the company also was working the real right wing, you know, John Bircher types owned that company at that time. time. I mean, uh, uh, the Bradley Foundation, for those of you who follow really right wing foundation money, they helped create Scott Walker. Uh, that was the Bradley family money from that company. So they, they were looking for a way to bust the union if they could. And, uh, and they, so they were bringing in scabs and other things, and the cops were beating the hell out of our people who were trying to stop the scabs, basically, on a daily basis. And then Marquette University blew up in an anti-war protest, and the cops left. And then we won the strike. Okay, within days after that, because the scabs all of a sudden couldn't get in the building because the police weren't there to protect them. All right, so it was very crystal clear what role the cops had played in, in allowing an anti-union, anti-worker standard of living attack by a major corporation. Because once the cops were gone, the strike was won. So uh, there's a lot of lessons in that. There's a lot of lessons in that about what we can achieve when we have enough people in motion at the same time. Right, because there are a lot more of us than them. So um, I, I think that is correct historically. The problem is we don't have a labor movement right now that is in those kind of militant confrontations on a general basis with, with corporations. And uh, here and there, yes, but not, on a, not certainly at the level that we did in the 30s or even the 40s and 50s and 60s. And so people aren't having, union leaders aren't having that same experience. And then lastly, the question of uh, African Americans uh, being more unionized than other folks. I don't know the exact numbers. I certainly know African Americans, by far, if, if, uh, are in a workforce, are much more likely to see the value of a union. And frankly, you know, it, it ends, it, it unfortunately leads to double discrimination. You've got employers who are already racist to begin with, right? And then on top of that, they think, you know, these are people who are going to stir up trouble, you know, because they'll support a union or whatever. Uh, so we certainly recognize that connection, but unfortunately that's not represented in the leadership of a lot of trade unions. And especially the trade unions that have a lot of political sway in Chicago, for example, when you think about the building trades, for example, you know, very, very little African American leadership, a little bit more membership in some of the unions, but even not that much there. So, you know, there's a representation issue there that, that we got to deal with as we try to move the labor movement on this. But, uh, Rich, Frank's got his hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to respond to the question. Sure, sure, I'm sorry. Well, you know, you, you raised some very important, a very important question. Very important question. You know, I want to underline it about 25 times. <laughs> because we're talking about racism. You know, and the trade union movement as a movement in the United States has never seen the centrality of the question of fighting racism in order to advance the agenda of the working class. That, that just hasn't been the case. That's why Trump's statement was so important recently, right? That was a historic statement. I mean, when did the last president of the AFL-CIO come out and talk about racism? Huh? When did that happen? You know, I don't think it ever happened. Now, if you got something on the contrary, you show it to me, you know. <laughs> um, and that's a problem. That's a problem, you know. I, would, I, I wouldn't even challenge the statistics as to whether or not black people were proportionally more union than anybody else. That's probably true. You know, uh, but I think that that doesn't translate into the trade union movement seeing this as a central question, does it? I mean, just because those those statistics are true, that doesn't translate into policy. You know, so what's really going on now is this: there is an uprising going on in these United States right now. And it's an uprising against police, vigilantism, terrorism, however you want to characterize it. You know, we're tired of being murdered by the police and them doing it with impunity. You know, so there's, there's an uprising. You know, Ferguson was just one of the most explosive examples of it. But it's been going on for quite a while. 
you know. Now, the question is, how does the labor movement and every other section of the society stand in relationship to that question, you know? And I think that labor has made a breakthrough on it, you know, with, with Trump's statement, you know. Uh, it's a question of going forward from that. You know, what's the basis of going forward, you know? Because uh, we can't go forward if we study focus on what the differences are that keep us from going forward, you know? What's the unity that we can start to build mm -hmm. to go forward, you know? Everybody ain't gonna have exactly what they want exactly right now, you know? But what is the basis for going forward on this question? talked a lot about this question of, of the police and the labor movement in, in a somewhat abstract way. You know, should we be, you know, the question was posed, should we be trying to drive the police out of the labor movement and so on. But I, I think where the rubber hits the road on that is the question of whether our demands are, you know, the demands are going to, we need to come up with demands that are strategic for the moment we're in. But the question is, do we, do we, do we make our demands such that they won't be, that they'll be palatable to, for example, the prison guards or the FOP because we're afraid to confront them within the labor movement? Or do we actually make demands that we think are the most important on this question or the right demands on the question of, uh, of fighting for uh, police accountability or, or against police violence? So for example, I, I guess I just wonder is, do people think that the demand to fire Dante Servin, which I think would go up against the position of the FOP, you know, who, uh, um, you know, Ricky Boyd's killer, would that be, I think we would probably agree that that's a demand that we should get behind, right? Even yeah. though the FOP would oppose it. I, I'm curious whether everybody agrees with that. Um, I, I think, <coughs> but I, I think the other question, I think we <coughs> talked a lot about this is the question of, the, of and, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, just make this point and stop, but the, um, the question of revenue. You know, Tammy talked a lot about the police as being revenue collectors. And of course, collecting revenue in the form of fines and uh, you know taking control of cars and so on in a way that's very regressive, right? At the same time, we're in unions that are fighting to tax the rich instead of making these regressive red light and so on. And and I think another thing is that the, the city spends so much money on police and prisons, and our country spends so much money on police, military, and prisons. We also have to demand that they stop spending that money on those things and spend that money on public services. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I, one of my, I have a question is whether people think that that's part of what we need to be fighting for as well as people who are fighting mm -hmm. against police violence. So, uh, I mean, I think those are good questions and I, I, I don't think you'd have any argument with uh, most folks here that we have to be fighting on those other on those other issues if we're gonna have a society that, that works for us and where, where we're not gonna keep falling back into, into you know, this you know, brutal repression <laughs> of, of people who are in poverty and have no way out. Um, on the specific question of the Dante Servant, um, I, I will say UE signed on to, to a statement that was circulated calling for his, his uh, firing. I don't know uh, who else did, uh, what other unions did or not, but I think there were some other union signatories to it. I will also say, though, there were two versions of that statement that got circulated. And the first one that got circulated had an extra paragraph added in that was that, that and it, this, was a, this was a petition, a letter going to the head of the police department, to McCarthy. And it had a whole paragraph in it trashing the FOP and denouncing the FOP and basically saying that, you know, that essentially calling on the police department to start, start, you know, ignoring the FOP and just, you know, running roughshod over them or whatever. I, I can't remember specifics. But I sat there and thought, how can you ask a union to sign on to a letter to management trashing the union that represents their workforce? In what way are you going to build unity with the labor movement trying to do that? And fortunately, <coughs> Some folks in labor, and you started it, I think, yeah. uh, put together a second statement that called for the demand that needed was the demand of the day, which is to go on the record that Dante Servin um, 
shouldn't continue to be on the Chicago Police Department after what he had done, mm -hmm. despite the fact that, that they screwed up the prosecution, et cetera. And, um, and so unions were able to then sign on to that, which was a very, this is again back to let's have specific concrete demands that we can build unity around, as, as Frank said, as we, and, and then lastly, to your point about do we confront the FOP over some of these things, I, I think the way to think about it is the FOP is going to have to make some changes in the way it operates if, if we're going to get to the right place. I think labor needs to challenge the FOP to do it. I think there's ways to do it, perhaps, if we can win over enough people in the labor movement, to do it in a way where it's not, where we can help move them, as opposed to just confront and, you know, quote unquote, defeat them, all right? Because again, the FOP is not the enemy, right? The, I, I mean, the FOP right now from a day-to-day, -day, I saw your reaction back there, from a day-to-day -day basis, the FOP is standing on the other side of where we think needs to go on this issue. But they're, the main institution, what I would define as the enemy on this, is this militarized police department from the top down in a, a society that's structured to have policing to suppress communities of color and communities of poverty. And that's where, that's where our main fight is. Along the way, the FOP is going to have to adjust, and we have to help them do that. I'm with them and ask me also and the uh, very local that Ethel um, here was introduced from. Um, I agree with some of what the last speaker said and, and the way it was presented and also in particular Carl's point about the broader social uh, movements. Um, because I think that to any degree that we're going to be able to put forward um, and, and organize you know, an actual campaign around police accountability, is going to be measured by the extent to which we can really involve members from the labor movement, from our locals. And I think what every union can do will be different, depending on their members and where their level of consciousness is and, what, and who the people they serve are, which we also have to constantly be thinking of because that's how we're going to win all of the battles we're facing as a labor movement in front of us. Now, I'm very lucky. I'm in a local that's on a university campus. We have many black and white members who are not only members, but activists. And we were able to work together to come up with a resolution that was later uh, evolved at the convention. But I want to speak to how that happened. Because the consciousness of our members is uneven throughout. There were the people in this room who we may have different ideas of what our tactics should be, but we really agree that this is important and should be central. But the process to speak to one of the other questions here that went on at the convention was not only on the convention floor, but it was an individual one-on-one -on -one conversations, it was late into the evening, it was talking about our history as a society in the labor movement, and we have some proud moments in the history of our union, but in the history of the union, of many unions, there's some very not proud moments of not even allowing um, people of color to be in those unions. So some of that history, and that's what I want to ask the question about, it seems to me that education of our members in whatever union we're in, education of our members that aren't in this room today might be a critical part of what has to happen to be about the historical importance of this and about the immediate importance of this. Because we're not going to be able to fight right to work, which is threatening our whole country and threatening our state, unless all of our members work together, black and white and Latino and others. And that is the thing that I think the course of building this movement will have to happen alongside of that movement. So we're going to have to activate our members together, and some, that's yet to happen, and educate them. So maybe we could speak to how we could do that education better. Maybe speakers clubs like these could happen in some of our locals. And then we'll see people signing up to try to collect petition signatures for police accountability, and also to be out there in the street demanding some of the things that Nate from the Chicago Teachers Union spoke to that I think all of us public sector workers want to see happen. And that will also raise the consciousness of all our members to you know, fight racism in general, which we've come, as far as we've come, there's a long way we haven't come. So if you could speak to some of that. 
one of the things when uh, we were talking about the um, the police, I was thinking about how um, that with, through ed reform, there's like attack on on teachers and teachers unions saying that teachers union um, are trying to save the jobs of, of of bad teachers. That there's so many you know bad teachers, and that's why our education system is failing because you know these bad educators. <clears throat> Excuse me, but as educators. You know, and for the most part, we know that that's you know just some rhetoric to, to uh, again destroy our unions to shove through ed reform and do some other stuff. So if we uh, consider if if the um, general public's view of of you know the teachers or the or the or whoever is all based on a slanted, propagandized view of the world, then our members are probably. Um, are your party to that too. So there is a, a real need for education. And you're right that education probably has to come from you know venues like this or the interactions with uh, people within your union and people within your community. Because otherwise their only um, view of, of something they're not involved in or familiar with is, is going to be something negative. And that negativity is again is so that uh, the right to work thing can get push down our throat because we'll be so right now we be on we're like in a union we're all like under siege from whatever so if we're focused on the battles that we have here then we're distracted from the things that are really gonna um, be our demise so you're right education is important outreach is important because we need everybody involved or else we're gonna lose one, one real quick comment on right to work mm -hmm. Ohio right to work got rolled back in part because the police were also targeted and the police played a major role in overturning it, mm -hmm. all right? And the labor movement in other states recognized that. In fact, it's one of the, one of the points in Illinois is um, Rahner has successfully united the labor movement here in Illinois yeah. uh, because his attack was with such a broad brush. And, and so in the midst of that, you're gonna find it very hard to get very many labor unions to confront or attack the FOP. It just is not strategic. But yes, there need to be changes in the way the FOP conducts itself in this sort of situation. But it's gotta be in the, in the context of we're trying to change the whole police department and how it operates. You know, I make a reference. Uh, we have some uh, CPAC literature and petitions in the back. Let me encourage people to read the CPAC literature. Uh, read all of our literature. Go, 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 on, go online. Uh, Stoppoliscrimes.com. It's on the post Yeah, and, and read, and, and, uh, and also go to Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Oppression on Facebook if you have Facebook. And then, and then just read our literature. Nowhere in the literature, nowhere in the literature are we attacking the FOP. Nowhere in the literature are we making the FOP the issue. That's right. You know, the issue is police crimes police crimes. If we don't stay focused on this, we're going to get confused on it. We're talking about community control of the police. There's a whole lot of other things you could talk about with regard to the police. A lot of other things. We're not talking about a lot of other things. We're talking about community control of the police and stopping police crimes. And we got people whose lives are languishing in jail right now as we sit here and speak. You know, we got a brother out of jail. He had 40 years. We brought him home because we were focused. We brought him home because we were focused. If we'd have been fighting on every other issue, we wouldn't have got him out of jail. We got another brother out of jail. He was in there for 28 years. He was a torture victim. His name is Mark Clemens. We wouldn't have got him out of jail. They got me out of jail. I had life in 50 years. They wouldn't have got me out of jail. You know, This is not an abstract proposition at all. We're talking about concrete struggles, and we can count our victories because of the way that we have waged these struggles. You know, we're not having a philosophical discussion here. You know, we're having a political discussion that also involves some practical work. You know, and sometimes we bring in things that that that, that are just not that. You know, we're not fighting a political issue with the FOP and the trade union movement. What we're fighting for is community control of the police. And we are very focused about what we're talking about. We're talking about stopping police crimes, just like it says on the sign. Okay, this has been a very valuable discussion. 
Uh, and, you know, as chair of the Labor Committee for the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, um, it's very important that you all understand what, we, what we're facing. Um, we are actually talking about a major threat to any hopes that we have for establishing a democratic society. Mm -hmm. if, if we can't um, take control, community control of the police, then, like Frank said before, we're living <coughs> under tyranny. If you're a black person in a black community, you know how violent the police are. The gang members that I talk to have informed me without question that the police are another gang. They look at them as not being the police. They look at them as another gang. You know, that same kind of mentality. Uh, but even worse, even more threatening, because they have the power of the state behind them. And so they, are, they, they can operate without impunity. The gangs have to cover up and hide their stuff. But not the police. They can kill you on video. It makes no difference. So, you know, we, we're, our lives are being threatened uh, in a way that you all need to understand that we need some immediate action. We need some, some things immediately have to take place. And one of those things is community control of the police. Before we can move further into other things, we have to fight for community control of the police. And, you know, we're under this hierarchy um, of politicians, you know, led by Rahm Emanuel in the city of Chicago, who is extremely threatened by CPAC and by the teachers union uh, calling for a democratically elected um, School, school board while we're calling for an elected civilian police accountability council. So these are two things that will create a more democratic society for us, but they're being opposed because they're threatening the power of, of certain people who are backed by big money. That's why everybody on, on the Chicago um, school board are, are business people. You know, they're running it like a business. And the only purpose for being on that school board is to make money. So they're privatizing everything they can and uh, blocking anything that will allow citizens input. And the same with the, uh, with the police. You know, and so they're, well, they're protecting these, these things. They don't want any kind of other input into it other than those who are in power with the money and with the uh, political sway um, to be in control. So I just want you all to be very clear on that and also to offer to, to all of you, if you need the input of the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, we'll come to your union hall, we'll come, we'll meet with you and your members to help explain what, what CPAC is about. So once again, I appreciate you all being here. Thank you. So um, before we go to the last question, I want to thank everybody again uh, for, uh, for coming out. Uh, we're going to, um, you know, when we break up, if, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a time limit on the hall. I should look at the, the boss over there. No, but, as long as Jay stays. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so if people can stay in. Uh, if you have questions for the panel that you did, I didn't get to because I see there's some out there yet, uh, you know, you, uh, as long as they're hanging out, you can, talk, you can talk and mingle amongst yourselves. We have some water and such in the back. So, Joe, do you want to give us the last question? Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, uh, so I'm a, um, a member of the Alliance. I'm also on the executive board of SEIU Local 73, as is Kathleen Jensen. From the Labor and, and the Labor Committee. And the Labor Committee. He's a co-chair. Co and also, uh, <laughs> Justice Furtado is also on the executive board of SEIU Local 73. Um, and uh, Local 73 uh, adopted a resolution unanimously in support of civilian control of the police at uh, a membership meeting as well as an executive board meeting um, earlier this spring. 
uh, early this year. Uh, and uh, you know, about, I don't know, a dozen or 15 of us took part in the march on August 29th. Um, and I just want to say that, uh, you know, like related to what Linda was saying earlier, like, you know, wh where did this come from, this resolution come from? Well, it came from, first of all, um, a, a rank and file organization where Kathleen and I work. Um, which you know now has about uh, we, we represent about 3,500 people at the university where we work. But um, a, a few years ago, I, I was in a meeting with uh, members of the, 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 the leading members of the clerical workers at UIC. And in this meeting, there were like 15 or 16 people, and we, we got onto the topic of, of, uh, of the government authorities raiding your home. It came up because of something that happened to me and my ex-wife. We can talk about that later. Um, and, uh, and every single person in the bargaining committee had had, at some point, these are all African American and Lat women and Latinas. I'm the only guy and I was the only white person on the committee at that time. Every single one of them had had, during their life, either the Chicago Police Department, the Cook County Sheriffs, or ICE kick in a door or force themselves into a home where they lived. 16 women each had a story. So when, when Frank Chapman and Mike Elliott brought this proposal to us, we took it to, um, we have a rank and file committee at, at UIC, our joint bargaining committee. We took it to the joint bargaining committee and said, should we propose this to the general membership of the union? And it was almost unanimous. Like, yeah. heck yes, <laughs> something has to be done about the Chicago Police Department. Then we took it to a general membership meeting, and the only people who debated it were our members who worked for the Chicago Police Department. And you know what they said? They said, our asses are going to be brats when we go back to work Monday and the CPD finds out that Local 73 adopted this resolution. And what we said back to them was, you know, that's going to be really, really painful for you to have to talk to the police officers that you work for. That's really going to be difficult. But all of America is having this difficult discussion. It's painful. You know, this is what happens, you know, when you take responsibility. You have uncomfortable discussions with your coworkers. So anyway, the point is, yeah, you start with, you know, you start with the consciousness of the people affected. Um, and how are, how are people going to even argue with that uh, unless they're going to be straight up racist? So um, it went, it sailed through. Not a single vote against it in the, you know, a meeting of 200 uh, workers. So Dude. we got copies of that here. All right. panelists a chance to comment on that or any closing remarks they want to make. So let me start with you, Stefan, if there's anything you want to just continue to speak truth to power. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna just add to what the brother just said. Unity plus struggle plus organization equals victories. Um, this was good. The conversation was good. Thanks uh, for the invite. And the teachers are going to have their, their rally on November 23rd. So hopefully everyone can come out for that. So thank you. I, I just say um, this issue is important not only for itself, but because to challenge it, we really take on a lot of the central issues in our society and a lot of the things that are wrong about our society. Mm -hmm. So uh, the more we can unify people and organize people around this issue, the better off we'll be at building a people's movement in general. Hey. 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 Chicago Labor Speakers Club, thanks you all for coming out. Give another round of applause for all our friends. Hey.